Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose Yuen Campus in Hong Kong. Thanks for joining our program this evening, Dinosaurs, Expeditions, and More. We're sharing tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the UChicago UN campus in Hong Kong. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. And I also encourage you to visit our UN campus website at www.uchicago.hk and subscribe to our e-news for the latest UN campus programs and information. Or you can also follow our UChicago UN campus Hong Kong social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and now our new channel on LinkedIn. We'll wrap up tonight's program with more information about upcoming events, so be sure to stay tuned until the very end. Tonight in the Director's Pick series, we have Professor Paul Sereno with us to talk about dinosaurs, his upcoming expedition to the Sahara Desert, and his vision and plans to build two groundbreaking zero energy museums in Niger through the Niger Heritage Foundation. Professor Sereno is a professor at the University of Chicago and explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society. He works with students, technicians, and artists in his fossil lab to bring the, to life fossils unearthed from sites around the world. Professor Sereno's fieldwork began in the foothills of the Andes in Argentina, where he discovered the first dinosaurs to roam the earth some 230 million years ago. Other expeditions have explored Africa's Sahara, Asia's Gobi Desert, India's Thar Desert, and remote valleys in Tibet. He also works every year closer to home excavating his own Jurassic Park, a dinosaur graveyard in Wyoming's Bighorn Mountains. With a menagerie of spectacular dinosaurs to his credit, he's also known for discovering a series of extinct crocodilians, including the 40 foot long dinosaur eater dubbed Super crop. Professor Sereno's latest discovery, a human burial site in the Sahara predating the Egyptian pyramids, provides a snapshot of life in a once green Sahara. Featured in National Geographic magazine and many documentaries, Paul was named Teacher of the Year by the Chicago Tribune and was awarded the University Medal of Excellence from Columbia University in 1999. He co founded Project Exploration a novel science organization that recruits future scientists among urban youth. And that effort earned Paul the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring from the White House in 2009. Professor Sereno, welcome this evening. Why don't you uh, walk us through uh, a little bit of your background for those of, you, uh, of our audience that don't know you already. Um, Tell us how you got into uh, exploring dinosaurs and excavating in the desert. We're really curious to hear about that. Sure. My, I, I noticed my my nose is a little red, and that's from scuba diving uh, out in uh, the Hawaiian Islands uh, because that's a favorite pastime of mine. And that's actually what I wanted to be when I was young. I saw Sea Hunt, Lloyd Bridges. And I thought oceanography was about fighting bad guys in oceans. And uh, I thought this was the greatest thing. And so it was the thrill of my life uh, in graduate school when I did go into paleontology to find that my first field site was south of the Barrier Reef and took up diving at the same time. But life is filled with lots of um, challenges uh, and science uh, likewise. And as a scientist, you end up, I think as a good scientist, you end up picking up things that you never had any background in with vigor and willing to take on challenges because that's really what science is about. It's about pushing the frontier back, what we don't know. And sometimes and often to get to what we don't know, you have to start with what you don't know. So that's um, that's what science is about. And I didn't understand that as a child. As a child, I was not doing very well in school. And I, I the four square walls sitting around all day uh, for long periods of time for a lot of kids and not just me is um, is the way we teach. And it's probably the way we teach only for another portion of this century, because our learning capabilities and facilities are changing at a, a pace that's going to 
tailor what we're interested in, I think, closer to the individual. And what we're, what I faced was, you know, almost flunking, literally, I couldn't connect. And I learned my science in out of school time, back home, in park district programs, I loved it. I went around collecting leaves. And that was my background in science, uh, I natural history. And when I got my act together, it was an art, not science. And I read a dictionary, got into college and uh, started doing art and then discovered science at the very end. I had a professor who was showing these slides of, of fossils. And I, I, I followed my brother when he was applying to, to various schools and I walked into the American Museum and it was, it was all over in a, in a rush. I was in the fossil hall. I saw travel, I saw artists drawing things. I saw a life of adventure and science. And I said, this, this is what I need to do and I need to do it here. And I went off uh, after that to the, to, to the American Museum in New York, Columbia University to begin my career. That's, that's in a nutshell short. So I started out as an artist, uh, found that visualization is absolutely key to science. And so I had a big up uh, on, on others in the field that don't have a background in art and visual science. And it's, it's continued that way with CT scanning and reconstructing things. My field in particular, when you travel back into the past, is about visualizing the past. You have a knack for that. That's a huge asset. That's how I got started. And, um, and we could segue into uh, the field work, if you'd like, as to where I started or what, what would you like to? Yes, I'm, I, you know, I just I find that background in art and how you, um, you know, built a career in science so fascinating. Um, but, you know, you and I met in uh, 2009. Um, you know, we were at the, uh, the Beijing Center, the U Chicago Beijing Center opening in 2009. And I sat on the bus next to you. And I was so fascinated, if you don't mind just telling the story, uh, since we are in Asia and we're sitting in Hong Kong, tell the story about your first trip to China um, back in the 80s. I was there at the same time and I was so fascinated with that experience and that adventure that you had. Maybe you could share that with our audience before we talk a little bit more about your work in North Africa. Sure, uh, you know, I used to, as part of my uh, inabilities in school and difficulties, I, I hated writing. And when I got to college, I was therefore a very challenged writer in English classes. And now I love writing. And I think that's also true of a, of a good life or a well-spent life. There are things that you think you're no good at that you actually have incredible talent at, maybe even at different times of your life. And so I love writing. I'm one of the few scientists who actually write stories in National Geographic. And it was a particular style there. And I am going to write a story about this journey that you talk about, because it was very, very formative for me. I got to graduate school, the school that I wanted, the museum I wanted. The first trip was to Lord Howe Island, south of the Barrier Reef. I pick up scuba diving at the same time. I'm finding a horned turtle. And then the second job, uh, I, when I flew back, was they felt I was capable. I They gave me a pickup truck in Wyoming, and we hiked to the top of this mountain where a skull was found at uh, 10,000 feet, a huge rhino ancient rhinoceros type skull of titanothere. They spray painted it pink. A helicopter came in, dropped it into the back of this truck in Wyoming and gave me the job of driving it back to New York from 7,000 feet. And of course I arrived, it had extra tanks, one tank of gas. What a field, this is just everything I dreamed of. And yet it seemed missing something. I really was, challenge to think that I wanted to make the, the world in some way a better place to connect what I was doing, spending a lot of effort on. Rather than just self-fulfillment, I wanted it to make the world somehow a better place. And I couldn't see how I could do that with paleontology. So I was beginning to question whether I was just going to grow old, gray, and turn into a fossil myself, maybe naming a few things and not make much of a change or difference in the world. When I came upon my PhD project, which was by the time I got finished with it, a trip around the world. In 1984, it was a very different world than today. China was a very different place than today. It was just coming and opening its doors to the world. 
you and I were some of the very first travelers to go around China and outside Beijing. They had just opened 25 cities. Uh, these cities were not prepared for foreigners. Uh, I had uh, a couple of words of Chinese. There's no English. You had to take trains and you wouldn't know where to get off. It, it, people were still all wearing blue and green, uh, what we would call Mao, Mao jackets and, and clothes. It was the China that once was, and you could really see it. And yet they were friendly and open. And it was, it was an amazing so I started my journey actually in Hawaii where my father came from and I had a return ticket from London eight months later. I liquidated enough money that I thought I could survive with whatever I had. And I brought literally army bags full of film, which you weren't supposed to be able to get out of China, then USSR or across a then wall in between East and West Germany. Poland was undergoing Solidarność riots how could I possibly survive this with my film, especially? Well, I did. And it was a formative story of traveling 5,000 miles in China, really getting to fall in love with the place, and also going on the Trans-Siberian, being the first person to get back to the Flaming Cliffs, the first paleontologist uh, after Roy Chapman Andrews, which sort of sent me on my journey in paleontology. That was special. And I literally collapsed on my knees when I got to the Flaming Cliffs. I couldn't believe that I was there. What an adventure. I knew the field at that point was not only going to teach me more about the world than I would ever learn from a political science course, but that people around the world love their history, their personal history, their natural history, the natural history of their local region. And you know what? They want to keep it close to home. There's more museums today by at least a factor of two than there was then. And I realized that this discipline of time travel is almost innate to human and something that makes us very special among all species in the world. We're the only ones that appreciate time. We're the only ones after two centuries that appreciate deep time that can think of millions of years. And we love it. We're time travelers ourselves, the only species like it. And so I have centered myself on a discipline that is innately human and something that will connect to just about everybody everywhere. And so that's, that's uh, what I realized. And when I got to Chicago, again, I said science is about uh, learning new things. I realized that I didn't have ever a course Expedition 101. And yet I had done some travel in Argentina, realized that Patagonia was just coming into its own, just like China. There was a handful of students, uh, a handful of museums, one titular paleontologist, Jose Bonaparte, that I could connect with. And it was a transition point for Argentina as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I thought that I would go there to start my work. But anyway, um, I can flow into your next question. But what I realized when I got to University of Chicago is that, um, you know, you might have to learn Spanish. You might have to learn how to lead an expedition. You know, I was supposed to be a paleontologist, perhaps one of the best. And yet I'd never led an expedition. And uh, how, could, how would I know how to do that? Well, you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to be a diplomat. I learned the ancient how to figure out DNA. I never had a course in genetics, not a single course in genetics. I set up a DNA lab. This is what science is about. The other things about science is about is about discoveries. And the thing I learned deeply about discoveries, uh, it would take a while, is that the biggest discoveries are things you never expect. There's two kinds of discoveries. I went to South America to make the first kind, which is there's a valley. Some people found some old early bones of dinosaurs there, but no one ever found a skeleton or a skull. I'm gonna go and find a skeleton or a skull, the earliest dinosaur there. And guess what? I did. I found it. <laughs> and then there's a second kind of discovery, which is I went there to find something. And lo and behold, I found something else that was even bigger and better. A discovery being something that you didn't anticipate. Those tend to be, that's really the true meaning of discovery. And those tend to be the biggest. They're also the ones that you could step over in the field and think, I didn't come for that. I don't know what that is. 
And I think in my career, those are going to be the things I'm remembered for more than the other kind of discovery that was anticipated mm. that I didn't miss the biggest thing staring me in the face, you know, our expanding universe. When you go back for the big discoveries, scientists were out looking for different things. And they said, well, what about this? And they pursued it. And it turned out to be a bigger, a bigger discovery than they ever imagined. So anyway, that's a little bit about science, a little bit about discoveries and how I got started uh, with a landing a job at the University of Chicago out of graduate school. And, and what year was it that you um, landed at University of Chicago? And then could you tell us um, what year it was that you did have to lead your first uh, expedition? And tell us some of, about some of the challenges of that and, and where that expedition actually led you. Yeah, well, you know, I, it turns out I would, I would come back from even my art trips. I took a trip, my first trip to Europe, uh, studying cathedrals and uh, Moreau and Picasso museums. And the adventures I would have in the free time I was given, my mother who's an incredible uh, uh, woman and my father both, uh, you know, my mother would just say, don't tell me anymore. <laughs> don't tell me what you jumped a train <laughs> in Europe. You, you, you went and, and, and hid out in a haystack in, 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 on a mountaintop <laughs> in Switzerland because you didn't have enough money for it. Don't, don't tell me anymore. And I realized that um, adventure travel is part of my, my, it's in my blood, you know, and I came to the University of Chicago in 1987 after finishing a grad. And you know what I did before? I said, you know, I need a break. I've gone through six years, seven years of graduate school. I'm going to do this exhibition. I told him I needed to do this exhibition to the mountaintops of, of uh, Chile. It was an incredible expedition. We had to do part of it on horseback. And uh, I joined an exhibition from the American Museum and said, listen, I got to arrive about three months late. They said, okay. So after that expedition, I traveled through Argentina. I went into the jungles of the Amazon. I said, I might never see the Amazon. I, I, I went up uh, some of the rivers where there's real trouble now, where they're cutting forests down and the activity is, I did that and uh, had all sorts of adventures. And then I arrived for my first day at the University of Chicago, what is now 35 years ago, it's a long time. And uh, what I did was set up an office and they, you know, they're incredible at the University of Chicago. The best jobs in, in academe often involve some teaching. They involve a potpourri of things that you're never quite prepared for teaching again. I really didn't have a teaching 101. Uh, you have to learn how to do that, learn how to make presentations, learn how to raise money, learn how to define a research career. And in my case, learn how to lead an expedition. So I was there and I thought, you know, I, I uh, began to apply for, for grants and very competitive uh, when you are starting. And I thought, well, if I'm going to start with dinosaurs, I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm going to go for the earliest dinosaurs, which we know almost nothing of, so I could root whatever I'm doing, root that tree. And uh, it was very competitive, and it looked like it might not even uh, be that possible. You don't have very much time to get your act going. But I wrote a letter down to this titular appealing intelligence in South America that I'd met, Jose Bonaparte. And he wrote me back a letter. We were writing letters at that time and sending, sending them even to different continents. It's rather remarkable and beautiful history where you can, you can look at a letter written by, uh, you know, a, a famous paleontologist and, and paleontologists actually signed reprints. Like I have one from Stephen Jay Gould. These are treasures now because we're in such an E world, and a little less personal. Jose wrote me back and said, listen, um, ever thought about going back into the field? And I remember grabbing this letter and walking into my colleague's uh, office and I said, look, here's a proposal <laughs> that's got teeth. And I, I, I wrote to NSF, I was a youngster and I, I wrote for enough money to do an expedition. And they said, oh yeah, sure. But, you know, we don't, here, how about this tidbit? And if you find some fossils and you can show, because it's real problematic, you can show you can get them out of the country, hey, we'll give you more. And they gave me far less than I needed to run an expedition. But then Argentina came to the rescue. Their economy collapsed. It happens every once in a while down there. And all of a sudden, my money was worth a bit more down there, like twice as much. So it was still not enough money. But if I changed it on the black market, in an apartment in the second floor somewhere in Buenos Aires, 
on the advice of paleontologists, young paleontologists down there, and given their state of the economy, I could pull it off. You see what I'm talking about in terms of challenges? And then you go out in the field, you don't have a car. Jose Bonaparte and I visit a Middle Eastern who has a Norwegian wife and wants to sell a car and we buy it for $3,000. And we go and see the car and it, it, it only has one detail that needs to be fixed. There's no engine in it. The engine <laughs> is on the floor. And he promises that the engine will be in except that there's no electricity in the city that night. They get the engine in anyway, it's smoking. Uh, I later find out that Jose Bonaparte, who was going to there go back to Buenos Aires at that point, gave his student the sign of the cross. May God be with you. You know, and we headed off to a field we had no maps of 300 miles north, the car smoking. Goodbye. Are you going to survive? We we didn't have uh, refrigeration or anything. We had to hang strips of rib uh, beef in the trees. Uh, and what would happen after that is legendary. We found in three weeks the first skull and skeleton of the early dinosaur, Herrerasaurus. We found hundreds of specimens. We blew it wide open. And the students have never turned back. Students there are leaders of a new museum in San Juan. We came back uh, with stunning discoveries. And I came back with an understanding of how to lead an expedition, how to relate to local people, how to pull off the impossible. And... Uh, it, I managed to get the skull out. I became a diplomat when I came back to, to our, uh, Buenos Aires. And, uh, you know, a career was, was just in the beginning. And that's how I started. Um, going to a place I'd never seen without enough money, without the language, and yet making more discoveries in a single field season than anybody had ever done in Argentina. That's really a remarkable story. And, you know, I'd just like to say that you're living the life that many people dream of, and probably many people would like to sort of get involved with if they could. It's a life that uh, I think only Hollywood movies really can, in some ways, represent, but you're actually living it. Which yeah, is you really know, amazing. just one, one pointer to that, we'll, we'll get to it later, but I'm about to leave on an expedition. I want to take more people on this expedition in a more tangible, nitty gritty way by getting under the skin of the students that are there, hearing their stories, many of them are gonna see the Sahara for the first time. Many of them are going to meet at a gate in Paris on our way down for the first time. Um, I wanna bring that to a global audience. Um, in a way, I've made a lot of films with National Geographic. You mentioned the connection with National Geographic. It's been a, was a great connection that we made because I learned how to write for a larger audience. I learned how to speak to a larger audience and making those films. But I wanna take it to the next level with the camera equipment we have available and the talented people. We're gonna bring this expedition to a global audience in a way that I think has never quite been done before. Now, are you still uh, looking for anybody to join this particular expedition? And maybe you can- No, you know, I, I, I canvassed around, uh, it's a special expedition. Uh, I, during the pandemic, prior to the pandemic, explored the far four corners of Niger, which is the, one of the greatest slices of the Sahara they have in that country, Niger, Niger. And um, I made scores of discoveries of entire skeletons that we brushed off and then buried for a day that we could return, held up by the pandemic. I'll tell that story a little bit. It's now four years later and I have assembled, raised the money and assembled I think the best team pound for pound that has ever been fielded because it's a large team, about 20. And mm -hmm. we're going to have even more uh, in terms of security guards. It's going to be like an army passing across the Sahara of some 50, 55 people. Uh, and you have to logistically support that with water and food. And you have to be very savvy about that, not to get lost, not to lose, lose people, lose vehicles. It, we're going to collect 20 to 25 tons of dinosaurs. We're not going to go into that now. We'll go into it later was what we're going to do. There's 20 students on that, uh, 18 students or so on that, very young professors or graduate students. Um, and they are pound for pound the best team I've ever fielded. They come from Germany, Canada, France, and especially Spain, and a few from my, my hometown of Chicago. And... Um, 
they are going to be the purveyors of this story to the world. But you're fielding, are you fielding students for this expedition from other institutions or are they all University of Chicago? No, no, that's what I said. Uh, the students come from Canada, France, Germany, Spain, uh, and we will have a few students from Niger. I have a few from Chicago to make up the roster of about uh, 17 students or so that are very young professors that are that are on this. Uh, most of them, except for one or two from Chicago that I have, one from Spain and one from uh, Chicago, have never seen the Sahara. But they have worked under trying circumstances and, and somebody knows them that I know very well and knows that they're capable of this. And then of course we spent some time speaking as we are now by, by Zoom. And uh, I, I, this is going to be formative. It's going to actually set up a long-term, they don't even know this, but it's going to set up a long-term relationship with the country of Niger when they get involved in the scores of new animals that we are going to uh, uncover uh, and bring back. Uh, that's only the beginning, of course, of a story of paleontology. The rest is elucidating those discoveries in, in, in terms of what they mean. And so this is the tip of an iceberg. And that iceberg is, is going to be buoyed up by a lot of new researchers involved in uh, a lot of new research projects. So, yeah, it's mostly students. I've always uh, had my expeditions that way because these are these are the, the, the kids and the young scholars that uh, that are l lustful of, of, of discoveries, their chance to make a mark. You know, I literally put it to them. Hey, you read those books on dinosaurs. This is our chance to write a chapter in that book these next three months. And it's a three month expedition. It's, it's, it's no sneeze, but this is our chance. And you will see them every single day getting up off of a mat in the middle of the Sahara and charging around like, uh, you know, like they're nearly running in, in temperatures because uh, of the excite, the little excitement of discovery and being part of something that is history making. Well, maybe you could tell us a little bit before we talk about um, this particular expedition and get into some of your slide material. How did you actually get um, connected with Niger? What year did that all begin? And it sounds like it's been a long relationship with um, the local people and the government there. Tell us a little bit about that. It, you know, it 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 was a lot. It it was and is a long relationship. It began in 1990, and I went to a meeting in uh, England. Uh, a paleontology meeting. I, you know, worked hard and struggled my first couple of years. As a matter of fact, I didn't quite tell the story, but when I first applied for a grant, uh, somebody had competitively applied for a much larger grant that sort of excluded my ability to write uh, and receive funding for work on early dinosaurs until I brought the field situation into it, which was really a different proposal. And I was considering uh, studying something other than dinosaurs. You have to react pretty quickly. You've got a couple of years to get going at a place like University of Chicago. And during that time, I went to a meeting in England and there was a entrepreneurial uh, paleontologist turned veterinarian to make enough money. He made lots of money. Veterinarians are well paid over there. And, uh, and, and now he was free to do his paleontology in association with the British Museum. This is David Ward, very uh, interesting man. And he was leading an expedition to the Sahara and was looking for another driver of one of the cars because we were going to drive out of England, put the boat, put the put the vehicles on a ferry, cross France, put them on another ferry, and land in Algeria and drive across the Sahara to get to Niger. I've done it now three or four times. Hmm. That was unbelievable to me. It was an adventure because it took me to a continent that I, that even then I knew was the least explored. It took me to a country and a part of the continent, the Sahara, that I said, I have to cross at some point in my life. There's no road that crosses it. North, south, you've got to drive across open desert, hundreds of miles. It was an adventure I couldn't resist. And I said, the only thing I need is an excuse to return. And I found that excuse uh, on the trip. We, we, uh, I, I bargained the, 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 the guy, David. He was looking at some fossil fish beds. Can I have uh, a week, you know, with my vehicle? Somewhat dangerous to go around one vehicle. And 
And I did, and I found dinosaur bone there. And then on one fateful day, uh, we ran into a nomad in the middle of the desert. This is what happens sometimes. You're in the middle of the desert, you see nobody to the horizons. And all of a sudden, some guy with a shash or a camel shows up because they notice everything. They notice your tracks or something. This guy shows up and through several language transitions, we were able, he, he asked us what we're doing. And we said, well, we're looking for these very old things here like this. And he said, well, you know, I know of a place where there's some big old things. Really? We thought, <laughs> now, this is, part, this is actually part of your job as an investigator in the field. And I'm very good at this. Um, could you describe those really old big things to me a little bit? And Because it, sometimes they're not fossils. And just as people calling you from Nebraska and they've got a, a dinosaur eye in their backyard. I mean, you get calls all the time. And you have to sort out the real leads from the the the, uh, the lack of you know for better terms you know some exotic ideas of UFOs in the ground and this sounded pretty promising. We get into cars now. This guy had never we put him into a car. He'd never been in a car before, and he's directing us as if we were a camel, which is to say over stuff that cars should not go over, and and we were like it was 120 degrees. Our cars were being beat up, and we were like, "This, this is a wild goose chase. We can't even do this anymore." And some of us stopped, and 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 one of the cars left, and we said, "He's not even looking back. I don't know if we're going to see that guy again." And ten minutes, fifteen minutes later, the car returns with the nomad in the front seat, and the, the guy pops out. He's a graduate student, wide-eyed. You, you can't believe this. You got to come and see this. And we drive over, and there is a field of huge dinosaur bones diving into the sediment. I walked onto the site, which would later we'd call FACO. And I'm looking at these huge bones, clear skeletons of an animal that's never been described. And I'm realizing, wow, there's a story here to tell. And it was bigger than I even ever imagined for anybody that could figure out how to get these new creatures out of the ground in a place like this. And it's no easy feat. And I started writing a little journal book, how to do it. I need a base in Marseille. I'm looking at the vehicles. I need vehicles like this. I tried to figure it out while I was in the desert. And at that point, of course, we didn't have GPS in the Sahara, which is incredible experience. You're using compasses. They call it the sand sea for a reason. It's like you're navigating a boat and um, in, a, in a vast sea of sand. And uh, you're trying to figure out uh, where to go and how you, and you, you, you're really paying attention to surviving. And uh, how could I get back to this place without a GPS? I went and I took two, four Polaroid pictures, put my compass north, east, west, south. And then I drove a straight line measuring the distance to the nearest track. Well, my four photographs in Polaroid form they look pretty much alike. <laughs> it wasn't going to be too much help. And I had the distance to a track. And on that basis, I wrote to NSF a grant to go back. And it would take a long bit of uh, Roy Chapman-esque fundraising from foundations and so on. But what really helped me was I was given a uh, Packard Award. And David Packard, the originator of uh, computers and the like, started a foundation because he started his business in a garage and uh, Hewlett Packard grew from that. And he felt innovation is for uh, aggressive young professors and they should just be given some money. And you, you tell me what you want to do. We're going to pick the best ideas. And um, here's, here's a half a million dollars. You go and do them. Mm. And they wanted no, very few strings attached. And it was one of the first applicants from the University of Chicago. And I said I was going to figure out dinosaur life and how, how dinosaurs adapted to drifting continents. And they said they'd never, I later found out, they said they're never going to get an application like this ever again from any university. They think, you know, all we want to do is make computers or something. And they, they send computer scientists, you, you have to have one of these awards. <laughs> and so with that award, I was free to go to the Sahara. And that's the beginning of the story. I put together a young team to cross the Sahara. We encountered hurdles as I have never encountered 
on any expedition before that essentially shut the expedition down and then it came back alive in a book that I need to write because hanging in the balance was the rest of what I did in Africa when you look at it in hindsight. Mm-hmm. And we pulled off an expedition. We carried six tons of dinosaur bones back across the Sahara, across the Mediterranean, and flew them at the, at, at the, uh, at the uh, assistance of American Airlines to Chicago. And the beginning of my African journey was cemented. Um, it, it, it is a story that is, is, is worthy of a book in honor of the students who helped me pull that off. That's incredible. And um, I know you have some slides that you'd like to show us. Is now a good time to maybe share your screen and sure. show, you, show you know, us some of the things? Absolutely. That- and just as a, by way of introduction, you know, Niger is the way that uh, they pronounce their country name, sort of a French version, their Francophone country that sort of melds together all the local languages uh, uh, in, in uh, a single uh, French language from uh, colonial times, but it persists to the present uh, as the lingua franca, literally, of that country, Niger. And I started a foundation, Niger Heritage, uh, because as I began working in Niger and as the tons piled up, and then the discovery of the largest archaeological site in Sahara, which happened in the middle of it all, and now the burials are accumulating, I realized that this is bigger than any expedition. This is bigger than any single repatriation that's ever happened in world history by the time I'm done. And there needs to be a a repository, a place for this in Niger. And so I began this foundation now about seven, six, seven years ago as a way to visualize where this is headed and how the country and the people of Niger might benefit from it. And so this little presentation will introduce... uh, both what I'm sort of involved in and uh, and uh, a little bit about Niger Heritage. And so I'm going to share my screen now. And uh, so for people that uh, can uh, uh, see the, as soon as I pop this screen to full, there is Niger Heritage. And the thing I love about this word and why I chose it as a foundation word uh, is foundation name is that it means something to us, Niger or Niger and heritage, it's very recognizable, but it's also French, Niger heritage. And so for everybody, they understand what this is about and and it's very clear what it's about to people in the country. Now this is 2021 expedition to Niger because this expedition is delayed a year. As a matter of fact, it was delayed twice in the course of the pandemic until Uh, We're about to leave in about 10 days. And uh, the story of the expedition was told in a beautiful online piece and a full page story here in uh, in the uh, Washington Post in 2021, stranded in the Sahara by COVID, 20 tons of dinosaur bones. Yeah, and more than dinosaur bones, crocodiles and the the history of mammals and, (laughs) and other things. And and so I explored in 2018 to 2019 huge areas of Niger, thinking I want to at least get to all four corners of this enormous uh, country. It's about half the size of France. Um, no, it's, sorry, it's about twice the size of France. And, uh, and, and basically, I wanted to at least touch the places that might have fossil bone. And in the course of that, discovered, as you can see in that photograph in the middle, we'll, we'll go into it, I discovered many, many uh, incredible discoveries. And so um, here's a picture of, on the upper left, a beautiful sail of the dinosaur Aronosaurus, one of the few named dinosaurs in Niger and in Africa. And it's the first intact sail of a dinosaur. There's a few famous dinosaurs that have sails. Aronosaurus was actually the first to evolve. It is the first dinosaur with a sail. And we piece these sail shapes together from fragments of spines, long spines found, or vertebrae found. Never have we found an intact sail of anything like Spinosaurus or Aronosaurus until now. And so this will really give us clues when we take this back to the laboratory and prepare it as to the shape of the sail, its use, uh, like we've never had before. We have a full sail. Okay, so that's an amazing thing. We have to tease it apart, collect it. And it's actually in a graveyard where we found 20 examples of skeletons like this. So some massive event happened 
And mm -hmm. we want to be able to tell that story. Now, the bottom picture is the beginning of a 60 foot animal that has no name. We have nicknamed this one iPod <laughs> for, you know, it's the internet age sauropod. Uh, beautiful skeletons of this animal await us. Now, when we go to the Niger, uh, which is located in the middle of, I don't know if you can see my arrow, it's located in the middle of West Africa. And you can see the Sahara Desert in the upper, upper globe. It's that bright overlit part of the northern part of the continent, which is enormous. It's about the size of the United States. Uh, we have to think back to the lower globe. Uh, we are going back to a time when Africa was just beginning to separate toward the end of the highest levels that we're in. It looked like that lower globe where there were waterways crossing Africa. It was very wet, different than it is today. And if you go back further, it will get closer and closer to South America until there's a land bridge. And the animals that we see in Africa most likely have relatives uh, on South America. So that, that's the Africa that we're traveling back to. Unless, of course, you find humans, which are much younger and would have lived in the Sahara that we see today, although that also looked different than it does today. It was called the Green Sahara more than 5,000 years ago before the pyramids. It was actually greened up by a lot more rainfall and animals that you'd never think of in the center of the Sahara, like an elephant, were there. And you're going to find those bones. Now, as a geologist, and paleontology is this beautiful field that sort of, is it biology? Is it geology? Is it uh, art? Uh, it's all these things put together. And so my degree actually is in geology, which is extremely handy if you're a paleontologist. You want to look under the sand, under any plant life, at the rocks that floor the country. And this is Niger. Niamey is the capital. It's down in the south west part you see it right down there in the bottom of the country that and it's on the niger river and that's the the shoulders of that river the wettest part of niger and as you travel north you travel through what they call the sahel which is the borderlands of the sahara and the whole upper part bigger than the size of france is the agadez region and that is the playground for dinosaurs and ancient humans and our center is Zagadez. It happens to be the crossroads of the desert, sort of sitting squarely uh, in the middle of the Sahara. Uh, cultures have crisscrossed on tracks, uh, Agadez, for centuries. And uh, we base out of Agadez and then go to those, especially those green areas that you see around Agadez. Those are Mesozoic in age. And not all of them are exposed. Some are covered by sand. Some are covered by sediment. But you basically have a situation where vast areas are covered, uh, are, are dinosaur age. And so when you looked at that picture in the bottom right, you're looking at a hot spot in the back. That's called the Ayer Mountains. They're not, they're really low by comparison to, let's say, the Rockies. But they're a hot spot on the geology map in the upper. That's the red, big red area. And what that hot spot did, it's relatively young. It's only about 20 million years old, 15 million years old. It poked up in the middle of the dinosaur sequence and tipped and eroded all of the dinosaur beds. And so as you move away from that hot spot into the desert, you get older, sorry, you get younger and younger. You start out with the early part of the dinosaur era and you get younger and younger. It's like chapter and verse if you've got the fossils and they're there in great numbers. You can start from the Jurassic period and work your way up to the youngest dinosaurs that have ever been found on the continent of Africa. So this is the complete picture. It is only exposed like this in one country on the continent of Africa, Niger. It is their story to tell for the world. When we tell this story, by the time we're done naming the animals that we find on this expedition, Africa will have one of the last stories of the dinosaur era to tell and the country of Niger can do this. And, and rightfully, it's world-class patrimony, world-class heritage. We need a place, a museum that can house something like this. I artfully did this mount of my first dinosaur discovery in Niger, Jobaria. We named it after a Tuareg mythical monster, Tuaregs being the nomads of the area, and posed it like this because it was, in fact, very elephantine in proportions. And we actually studied whether it could do this kind of a pose, and we believe it could. 
It was the first of a whole series of long necked dinosaurs we call sauropods. This is one I named after the country, Niger Sauro. It's one of the strangest sauropods ever discovered. It was really quite an eye opener when we discovered it because it's got a duck bill like snout uh, meant for cropping to the ground with 500 teeth that replaced faster than any other dinosaur had ever seen before, tooth batteries in a sauropod, never seen before. A beautiful, elegant animal filled with air pockets, Nisiosaurus. And then hunters, this is the first mounted theropod dinosaur. We think of T-Rex, of course, from North America. That was 1905, Barnum Brown, New York, earth shattering, putting it on display. He's discovered in 1905 by 1906, 1907, they announced they had announced the first mounted sauropod, and they put they put uh, Tyrannosaurus up, and the race was on across the globe to try to do something like what the American Museum had done. Well, this is the first mounted predatory dinosaur from Africa. I called it Afrovenator. This is another one that we found. And look at that. That's the moment of discovery in the upper left. Can you imagine walking across the desert seeing a jaw with teeth sticking out? that is 90 million years old. And it's just laying on the surface of the desert. You can just pick it up. And that's of course a new animal uh, by my left hand there is the skull which went into the ground and the jaws is to the right. Amazing, this, this would I would call rough face, Rugops. Uh, it was an abelosaurid dinosaur for those that are dinosaur aficionados and a uh, beautiful dinosaur reconstructed uh, in the flesh on the right. And this I would find uh, in, in trips to Morocco, but we also have uh, a new species from Niger, Carcharodontosaurus. We didn't realize how big it was until we put it together. Uh, this is a T-Rex sized animal with very different skull shape and teeth. Uh, there, is no, there are no Tyrannosaurs in Africa. And so other kinds of animals arose. We have found flying reptiles, large ones. We have found crocodiles coming out of our ears because crocodiles really pushed mammals out of the way. They were small and in great numbers on many other continents, including North America, the mammals, eating plants generally and minding their own business, but staying cat size or smaller. But those niches were largely occupied by crocodiles, not this huge one, which was a dinosaur eater. This is Sarcosuchus, the 40 foot crocodile reconstructed on the right. It was a great pleasure to work with an artist uh, to make that reconstruction on the right. We both, I visualize the pose as I often do. And then the artist literally took on, took over from there back and forth to create uh, a very accurate version. But not just big ones, but the small ones like this animal, we call uh, this, this animal Ananasuchus or duck croc because of the way it, its snout uh, was almost duck shaped. I, I, look at that Pinocchio nose. Whoever heard of a croc with a nose that sticks out like that? Crocodiles diversified into these upright, scampering animals that some of them herbivores that pushed mammals to the brink of extinction. We still have not found a good mammal uh, during the dinosaur era there. And now we found fish. Uh, this I call fab fish, the fabulous fish. It's an unbelievable fish that swam up the rivers in Niger with, um, with and among the dinosaurs. Uh, so you find everything. We've actually found bugs. We're going to be describing a scarab beetle. And then in 2000, one of those things you don't want to walk over is one of the greatest discoveries of my career. It's the largest archaeological site, the archaeological site that will tell the story of the Green Sahara. And it was found right here in the middle of the dinosaur beds. Those That raised structure that you see on the bottom left has 100 burials on the top of it human burials, and you see my team working some of them. And in a fashion that took us years to figure out, we understood that this area was actually covered uh, by a low lake, and those were islands in the middle of a lake. And people were living unbelievable lives in the middle of the Sahara, collecting fish, the animals that would come to the lake, elephants were around, hippos, crocs were in the lake, very different than today. This is climate change in prehistory. It's the greatest climate change, as a matter of fact, in Earth's prehistory, prior, to, when I say prehistory, prior to the laying down of the pyramid stones. Everything from that point on pales into insignificance except what we're doing today. So this is relevant to what we're doing today because the desert became, as it looks now, 
from a life that was almost a paradise lost. And that happened because of a climate change and the cycle of the, the cyclones from the Indian Ocean moving further south to the Congo. And it, it changed the nature of the desert. And these people were lost in time until we discovered them. And so if we put this on a diagram, it's from about 10,000 to about 5,000. We have 5,000 years. That's as much time at that site as the Egyptian pyramids to today. That's how much history is at that site, 5,000 years. And for 5,000 years, people lived in balance with nature in the middle of the Sahara. It's an incredible story and uh, very fortunate to have found it. Intact burials, jewelry, artifacts, we have the whole story. Okay, and this is a picture from when we discovered it. Now, I could have said, I didn't come here to find humans. I don't even know what this is. I don't know anything about the archaeology of the Sahara, and I could have walked onwards. And that site would never have been discovered. But we discovered it and started doing not just paleontology, but archaeology, uh, training ourselves. I had already trained myself in human anatomy because I taught medical students, so I knew the human skeleton very, very well, better than most archaeologists. But I didn't know about artifacts, tools, uh, <laughs> middens, garbage piles, uh, how to properly excavate something and then how to innovate and excavate it even better if you want something intact. For example, these burials are relatively small for us. I mean, iPod is uh, 10 times longer than a human. But how do you collect intact a burial that is so special? This is the most posed burial in prehistory, an eight-year-old, a five-year-old holding hands and overlapped with their presumed mother. How do you collect this? in sand when it's about to fall apart in front of your eyes. I had to innovate. I had to take what I knew from paleontology and combine it with archeological excavation to be able to do what has been viewed almost as impossible, bringing back intact with artifacts in place. You'll see there's an arrowhead between the legs of those individuals, another artifact between the leg of the one young individual. And as you look on the opposite side, all intact, there's an arrowhead on the rib of the woman outside the rib cage. These are offerings for the afterlife. Her hands are crossed and holding what appears to be her kids. We've looked at detail at the forensics of this site. We think they drowned in the lake and then were ceremoniously buried with fossils and unshot arrowheads for the afterlife. It is the most posed burial in prehistory. There's nothing like it until you get to the Egyptian tombs in terms of artifacts, and posing the burial for an afterlife. Uh, what a discovery that, I, that could have been lost in time in the Sahara. Now, we apply all the techniques that we use now routinely in paleontology to these uh, specimens. We CAT scan them, we bring them to the hospital. And so you can see, this is what uh, we, we have nicknamed this 10,000 year old man, accordion man. And he was the first to actually get an X-ray at the University of Chicago's new fancy X-ray machine. Uh, the first human was accordion man. And we can see his bones in cross section and we can actually reconstruct uh, his burial completely this way. Um, I'm, I'm uh, not gonna show that because uh, of short of time, but we've segmented his skeleton, made him stand. There's a documentary uh, showing how we calculated his height without moving a single bone with that CAT scan. Now, these people were making these beautiful petroglyphs in the Ayer Mountains and going there for clay, for pots, going there for, for, for gemstones, for their jewelry, and then going back to the Gobro where we find those gemstones and we find those pots. Uh, and so now uh, reconstructing a dinosaur, we can reconstruct a human. Of course, there's, there's methods to do this, plug methods and so on. And so right over some of the skulls, we reconstructed it. And I never thought as a paleontologist, I would have to wonder about human hairstyles. But here I am with a book on African hairstyles, wondering, is there any pattern to any of this? What, how should we reconstruct these ancient people from six to 10,000 years ago? And what I discovered is that men are very sloppy. We, we are very sloppy. We don't take care about how we look, but women always, culture after culture around the world, do things with their hair and look very nice. And so we chose a, a Tuareg hairstyle for this, and you'll see around the neck of the woman, the, and here I am as a paleontologist, and I get to describe the most beautiful pre-Egyptian jewelry ever found. 
It's a necklace with a pendant. You can't see the pendant there, carved in, in hippo ivory that we found around the neck of one of these women with ostrich eggshell beads. And those white beads, larger beads, are made from hippo ivory. What a treat to be able to, to uh, work among the peoples of the desert. This is the Tuareg peoples of the desert. They are my eyes, my ears. They keep us safe. They fix our vehicles. They, they show us where discoveries are to be made. I've worked with them uh, as uh, partners for thir those 35 years. And so the Tuaregs is one culture. There's Tubus, there's Hausa, there's all sorts of other cultures of the desert. And you see the tents in the background. They're mobile. They are the nomads of today. They are still crossing the desert the way they always did with camels. They have adapted in their modern cities to modern life. They want a museum. I want to help them get that museum. And so I founded Niger Heritage. And um, that's the logo we designed. It helps if you're an artist, you can think of things and work with others and make things like logos and drawings and stuff. And this is the French uh, version of our mission and our objectives. What I'm involved in now is the largest repatriation in the history of the world, a hundred tons of dinosaurs and as many as a hundred skeletons of ancient humans, older than the Egyptians. Imagine it, a country trusting essentially an individual professor from around, from a different country with this amount of heritage. It involves a lot of diplomacy, but it also involves a vision that wh where this stuff is going to go somewhere. And I, ca I can't leave that to chance because I make agreements with countries, yes, and sometimes embassies, but I have an unwritten agreement with dinosaurs and with ancient people. That agreement actually supersedes all the rest. It's an unwritten agreement that I'm not going to dig you up and then let your bones or your story crumble into dust because I didn't think about where you're going to be when I leave this field. And that's my agreement. And so uh, I am bound to find a way. And this is the way. Let people know what you've discovered. Make films. Uh, get local people involved. You see here a minister from Niger. He's at the University of Chicago on the Chicago campus. You see that person at the podium. He's wearing traditional garb. He's a student from Niger. And here we are talking about what kind of museum we can create. And the woman in the front of the podium who's back of the head, you see, she's one of the great ambassadors from Niger, appointed by Obama, an incredible ambassador. You bring ambassadors to her left as a businessman. And, and then there's then and then there's the minister speaking, and opposite him is, is a ex-rebel nomad from Agadez, who's the regional president of the Agadez region. Bring all these people to Chicago, come to Niger, present ideas, hone a plan. And even to get a vision of that plan, when they built a new airport in the capital, I put a dinosaur there and uh, everyone understands the importance of dinosaurs uh, in this country, the value of dinosaurs, how it tells Africa's story like no other country can. And so the idea is this is, uh, iPod brushed back a little bit further, waiting for us. It's waiting for us in the desert, just like that with some cover. And then we shoveled some stuff on top of it. Uh, this is an animal that we're going to have to think of a name of. Um, it's, it's just unbelievable. And so the students have all looked at this. Uh, literally, in 10 days, we're going to leave to dig this thing up. And we're going to be talking about it. Now we're using all sorts of new techniques. Uh, several of the students are very good at stereophotogrammetry which means that they can take a bunch of, of, of photographs, just like you, you do at the modern dentist's office now to get images of your, your instead of casting it, you can actually do it visually with, with cameras and efficient programs that put all of it together into a 3D. We're going to raise this thing out of the ground while we're digging it up and take a look at it. This is another incredible site. This is Africa's first microsite. Now, it doesn't look like much from here. This is a drone shot over us. Uh, I'm in the brown shirt there with the hat. And we're, we're, we're looking at a million bones in the sediment layer, a million, maybe more. Uh, this preserves, you see a little bit of a dinosaur tail, but it preserves all the small bones uh, of the animals from the area. And this, the sail I talked about of Aranosaurus. And, and here's another look at the microsite close. 
see all the small bones. Some of them are new animals. Some of them are animals we recognize. But by preparing those blocks, we will find scores of new animals. There's a flying reptile represented there, a small one. And so a microsite is an incredibly valuable thing. And we're going to cut up with rock saws and bring the whole thing back. That's the, a bit of the sale. We have to work out what happened so many years, millions of years ago. And then, of course, I'm going to bring somebody to attempt to find crystals in the sediment that can provide the first radiometric or what we call absolute date. How many millions of years old this is? More than just, well, we think it's so old because Iranosaurus sort of looks like a protohadrosaur, et cetera. Here's a new animal. That's the leg bone, the femur. Uh, we're going to go to a very remote area of Niger, a new area, and dig up uh, animals. Now, we came back with a new Spinosaur species from this area, and we, we left these bones for the expedition. We come to Gobro. We're going to visit Gobro again. That's a skull cap of a human appearing at the surface. That's how you often find them. You find the thickest part of the body when the body falls apart in a burial, your head. The skull cap comes to the surface typically first. And then this is how you take a skeleton out of soft sand. You have to harden it. Uh, you excavate around, recording anything out of the burial in a grid, and then harden it and take it out. This is an incredible burial. A student just wrote me a letter. It was the most formative experience at the University of Chicago in her career, studying to be an archaeologist. That's the jaw you're looking at, the front of the jaw of a woman. And behind, above the hand bones that are covering her mouth, you will see something in the background. That object in the middle of the burial is an elephant ivory bracelet. And uh, we've studied this bracelet. It is a giant elephant ivory bracelet. You can tell the climate of the day from that bracelet. Um, this is a picture after we got that ske skeleton surrounded because we brought it back intact. Notice the stars in the background. You will see billions of stars for the first time in your life if you ever go to the Sahara. Night is gorgeous, and um, you really appreciate um, the desert for its many, uh, many beauties. Um, so here's a here's a little vision of what um, we want to do in the capital. The capital is where most of the bones are going to go because it's part of the national collection. And so we imagine this is in French, the Museum of the River, because there's an island in the middle of the capital that they are willing to devote to this museum. This is a an idea of what the museum looks like. I will show you a fly through later. It is made of local materials, except for the photovoltaic cells uh, in the covering. It is zero energy. In fact, we think it's gonna be positive energy because it's cooler by the river to begin with. But those photo photovoltaic cells, those cone-shaped structures are a sequence of time through Niger. And it actually begins outside the museum with those boulders. Those boulders are billions of years old. They're holding the island. And they represent the formation of Africa as a continent from proto-continents. And then the story of the dinosaurs ultimately to Gobro, and then the modern story of the Niger River, which is the lifeblood of West Africa. And we want to make a reserve out of the island. The hippos are already there. Uh, you can see the wildlife of today uh, that existed in the Green Sahara. So this is a little look. In Agadez, we want to build a second museum. Now, Agadez, this is the heart of Agadez, the mosque, the largest structure in the Sahara. Um, and uh, it, it uh, is, uh, you know, it, it, like a lot of our old cities, it's sort of crazy back alleys and so on. Uh, it's now a bigger town. The Sultan is a, is a major cultural figure. I'm in one chair. The Sultan's in another chair. I've met him in Chicago. Uh, he's now meeting our team. They're all excited about this for what it might mean for uh, the town of Agadez to have a museum of their own there. And so they have a nascent university, which is on the right, uh, upper right. And we have actually a drone base to the upper left that we're operating. And in this uh, yard where you see that sort of tin covered building, we're going to take all those buildings out. We're going to build uh, a museum for them there right next to the university. And this is sort of our idea of the museum. It's a built like an oasis. Uh, you go to the modern Air fauna, which is of the desert. You walk back into the cultures of today, a room for the cultures of today, the cultures of yesterday, the dinosaurs of yesteryear. And you come out outside classrooms, performance areas, 
an orientation theater, zero energy, dust protected, a museum for the ages. Most of our natural history museums are not zero energy because they were built a long ago. They are, as, we, as I would like to say, an ode to the past, sometimes a very beautiful ode to the past. This is an ode to the future. We need to think this way for future cultural institutions. And I think people realize this. They, they have won international awards as best unbuilt cultural institutions. And so that's a little bit about the history. We need to record skeletons by drones, by maps. This is a hand-drawn map that I made of one of the dinosaurs to excavate these things. We're going to dig these up. These are Suchomimus or Spinosaur skeletons. Uh, we've digitized these maps now. We're going to bring digital things out in the field to excavate these, these amazing discoveries. And uh, there's also footprints. And these are stunning footprints of the animals alive today. On the left, you see this sauropod trackway with, an, with incredible detail. This animal walked across an intertidal flat, uh, not very far from those big skeletons I showed you. And so we've got track sites to look at. Sometimes you find the animal only as tracks, like this two-toed track of some Deinonychus, a velociraptor type animal, um, new animals to discover. And so that's that's a little bit. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you, if I have enough time here, to show you uh, a fly through of the uh, Niger River. Uh, let's get it going and then I'll go full screen. Here we are flying a drone over that island. It's a gorgeous island uh, with a little bit of farming, but it floods every year. It's wetlands. And that high part is where we're going to build on, on uh, pylons uh, the museum. And then there's going to be walkways across that. This is Niger. This is the Niger River. It flows down through Nigeria and out uh, into the Atlantic Ocean. It is the lifeblood of the capital, split on both sides. That's the Kennedy Bridge. That's the last major thing, the first bridge across the Niger River, the last major thing the United States has done civically in the country. We'd like the museum to be a lasting edifice to our uh, our collaboration uh, with this uh, with this developing uh, nation that is the most democratic of all in West Africa, and I think friendly to both Europe and and uh, the United States. And here's what the bridge might look like with walkways on either side and uh, a drop off area, <clears throat> parking back on the banks. Uh, we leave the island as a reserve and the museum as a monument to uh, to the heritage of their country and to what future museums might look like. And so you come in first through a the walkway here. Uh, you can arrive by boat. This will enhance tourism uh, in the capital uh, where they can have their own Parc du Bay right there in the capital. And there's an orientation and performance uh, area on the outside as you look at uh, displays uh, explaining the age and the origin of those granitic boulders uh, that, that uh, form and hold uh, the island. Uh, it's underlying all of the island, but you see them exposed right there. And as we walk in, um, you're going to notice uh, the terrace on the top, the sculpted uh, uh, roof, which is made of photovoltaic cells. It helps to create a cool space, but also absorbing uh, an incredible amount of energy. It's the tensile structure. You notice those tensile uh, beams coming down. Uh, and then as you go inside, we've built the double-walled museum uh, galleries covered with tile made from uh, local materials and local uh, traditional patterns. As you walk through, you can walk through in an orderly time fashion, or you can go to the cafe for a break. And if you're interested in archaeology, head to that hall or the one on the modern ecology of the river. Um, it takes advantage of what we know from traditional architect architecture as to how to handle ventilation and the sun and combines it with modern materials. And that's a little look at what it looks like. And if we now segue into looking at the Museum of the Living Desert, um, this is the Agadez region, which again, um, if I expand this here, you will see there are dry grasslands that dry to a crisp by the time we get there in, in, uh, in a few days. Savannah lands with acacia trees and then even drier areas that have essentially no vegetation. 
And um, in the middle of it all is uh, the city of Agadez. Why there? Because they have a water source. That's just exactly why Gobro was where Gobro was. Water is life, as they would say in their language. And that's what we wanted to somehow reflect. An oasis model for the expedition is what popped up. And there's the plan for it. There's the airport. There's a drone base right next to the airport. And this is where we want to put the museum. Right next to the university, because in fact, desert study Paleontology and archaeology have got to be things that they study in Agadez when people come from around the world uh, to uh, continue the study that we have only uh, begun in this country. And so here you, you come in. There's artisan shops on the outside. When you visit this, this town or any town in Niger, but especially in the desert, you're going to have silver makers. You're going to have artisans of, of various kinds of handicrafts that have been going on for centuries and are very prized. They're on the outside with shops. As you come into the square, there's public areas, but then you walk into a reflecting, over a reflecting pool. This is as if it were an oasis into a room that orients you to the Ayer and its fauna. And, its, and then in the second room here, the, the people of Niger, we haven't got the exhibits uh, digitally um, envisioned here in this fly through and eventually you end up with the dinosaur era with a dinosaur that's very particular to Agadez, found just outside the city. And you come out and over there are classrooms and dormitories. And on the top, the solar panels that make it all energy free. And the domes themselves, the double shell for ventilation and the double shell with the ventilation on this side allows ventilation and protects against dust. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, I've done this with uh, the lead architect of a big firm in Chicago. We've been working on it for 15, 20 years. And I think that's, I hope that's reflected in its beauty and, and functionality and sense with regard to local materials. And so that's the Museum of the Living Desert, a name that they came up with uh, for this, um, for this uh, um, museum. And, um, you know, that's where I think I, I'd like to um, conclude and uh, th just show you as a final, while I have the screen, as a final intro to the expedition, that um, this is a chance to write, as I say, to write a chapter in the history of paleontology. We're going to be doing so many discoveries. And so this is, oh, I'm going a little fast here. This is, you know, an epic desert triathlon. What's it going to involve? Three months. Uh, three months is a long time to spend in the desert. We're going to go to three areas. Uh, when you're out there, it is thrilling. It is also challenging. There's no question it's challenging. We are in the middle of nowhere. We cannot take showers. We face wash. During the day, it will get to 120. You won't sweat because it'll just evaporate off your body. Um, and while you're under those conditions, you need to dig up 20 tons of things. So quite, quite a challenge. If we look at where we're headed, uh, we're, we're going to start in Miami. We're going to go to the Oasis of Agadez, and we're going to deploy into the desert from there. One of my one of my preparators, uh, with uh, a little input from me, designed the expedition logo, Niger 2022. You get to do everything uh, in this field. That's the Agadez cross. They have crosses. They're not related to Christian crosses. They have these crosses that are very famous. That's the Agadez cross. There's about 20 of them. This will be highly meaningful for them. You see these beads? That reflects the archaeological beads that we found at Gobro. Uh, here's a look at my team. They involve uh, students from Niger, Manada at the top. She wants to be a museologist, and we hope to involve her in the Agadez Museum. Deep Beto, down on the bottom left, he's my eyes and ears. He's one of the great guides of the Sahara. A mechanic, a do-all, everything guy, my right-hand guy in the desert. Mali Dayak on the right, bottom. He's the son of the famous Dayak that the airport is named after. Uh, the legendary Mano Dayak, who wrote the book on the tears of the Tuareg, what they've experienced uh, in the 20th century, what we hope to uh, try to reverse in some way so that it's not just a, a story of uh, being marginalized, but a story of the, 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 the glory of their culture and the glory of the, of the natural history of their area. And then graduate students in between. Grace Broderick, she came from the lab school, wrote me a letter when she was 12 years old and said, can I come in and volunteer in your lab? I've known her since she's 12. She came in, sat down next to graduate students and just um, like nothing going. Her mother later told me the story. 
she said, well, I wanted to write a letter to uh, Paul Serino. Uh, well, okay, can I read the, uh, give me the letter because I'd like to edit it and read it. Oh, sorry, I've already sent it off. She sent <laughs> me a letter. I get this letter and I said, we've got we to make space for this, for this kid. And uh, she stuck with it. She's one of these kids, unlike me, who knew that she wanted to be a paleontologist since she was six years old, something like that, five or six, and saw a dinosaur and latched onto them. She's now finishing her master's at Bristol. She's going to be flying in from England uh, to the expedition. Left of her, Stephanie. I've known her for about 12 years now. She came as an undergraduate at University of Chicago, stayed as a graduate student, and now she's my postdoc above him, above her, Dan Vidal. I found him in Spain. He came visiting the collection. Clearly, this guy had, had promise, and uh, he's on the expedition now. He's my postdoc, uh, but one of the most promising uh, next-gen researchers from uh, Europe. And we go on down through the team with an interesting background. Some, many come from Spain. Uh, and, and some come from the United States. Jahan at the bottom left, he's my dating. He's a guy, he's, he's the, the best dater in the world, finding zircons to tell you how many million years old a site is. Here's another, here's the, the ending part of my team. Uh, Rachel's from France, Alvaro's from Spain, Vincent from France again. Filippo is, from, is originally from Italy, and he studied Aranosaurus for his PhD, and now gets to dig it up. Down at the bottom, Peter Felix Henningsen, He's the world's expert on rhizoconcretions, these, these, these reed-bound rock that helped me work out the riddle of Gobro. And we're going back for a last time to Gobro to finish the details on that study. Here's the history of the area. Mano Dyak, I mentioned him. And Philippe Tequet, he's still alive in Paris on Ile de Saint-Louis. I want to hopefully come back from this expedition and show him some of the discoveries personally. Albert de Laperon, the 20th century explorer, when it was really, truly even worse than it was when I went there the first time to be able to go out in the desert. That's the history of paleontology in this area. Uh, a little bit about Gobro and uh, the museums. That's an easier heritage. And I think I'm going to conclude there and just uh, open it up to any uh, questions that people have. Uh, and we do have some questions already. That was a fantastic um, presentation. Thank you so much for uh, providing that for us and sharing your vision and your experience with us um, in this amazing location. Um, the one thing that we do have one question already uh, from the audience about how, you know, um, the, I believe this is from a U Chicago alum, but it could be from anybody in the community here in Hong Kong or Asia. Um, how can they support, how can we support your efforts, the Niger Heritage uh, Foundation, um, while waiting for the museum to open and how long is the construction expected to take? Maybe that kind of leads us into how much money you need to raise and thoughts about where you might raise that money. Yeah, so these are big projects, of course, big ideas deserving of big projects, deserving of funding. Um, first of all, you can help uh, and feel a part of something by making a donation that can be done online at my website or at the Niger Heritage website. Just put that word Niger Heritage in, you'll find it. You'll find it on my website as well. All you need to find my website is Paul Serino and uh, you will find my website. You can donate online and any amount will go towards uh, the uh, Niger uh, project, either paleontologically or separately to the museum. We're in need of funding. We're at the point where we're going to sign agreements now when we go on the expedition for those sites. The country is very excited. We're at the point where we're ready to rock and roll with this. And yes, millions of dollars are, are needed, but it can come in pieces. And, and so any donation at this point will be founding uh, and will allow us to pursue larger sums of money. Of course, if we get large, uh, a large sum of money to begin with, uh, that that's great. Um, but anything will help at this point, literally, because we are now tying the dots, crossing the T's and tying the dots on the area it goes to uh, and, and all the formalities. And that's what's necessary for anybody that's going to give big money. They want to know that you've got the site down, you've got the plans down, and, and that's what we're going to have by the time we come back from this expedition. So we're ready to go. What are we talking about? Well, this is actually... Uh, a $300 million project, both museums together. Now, when you think about what we're doing, largest repatriation in world history, and that is included, 
included also as preparation and mounting of things that were iPod. I had to account for that. It has a space in the dinosaur hall. That means I've got to prepare and mount that dinosaur. It's included. Building two of the absolute most modern state-of-the-art museums, the first zero energy natural history museums in the world, one in the middle of a desert, the first museum in the, in the whole of the Sahara for the people of the Sahara, one in the capital that's going to unite the museum, unite the sides of the capital and make use of our great gift to Niger and West Africa, the Kennedy Bridge for $300 million. Okay, someone's going to make a name for themselves. Um, I've tried to make it as ultra economical as possible because uh, I, I want it to get done. And so there's no frills on that budget. In fact, most people would say you cannot do that for that budget, but we can. I've worked out the details. That includes even an endowment for professorial curator positions for both museums and a, and a small maintenance fund for them. Of course, part of our architecture is to be as maintenance free as possible. Uh, not just being energy zero, uh, but uh, or even positive energy, but uh, but also being resilient uh, to dust, to sun, et cetera. And so we thought this out quite well. That's where it stands. Um, are we an anticipating a large donations? Yes, we are, uh, because there's no project quite like this. Um, this is a up and coming democratic, largely Muslim, but also uh, Many religions are expressed in the country. Uh, country in West Africa that would be a great anchor for university programs, that would be an amazing space to visit someday to see uh, the Sahara Desert, to see the, the cultures of West Africa. Many of us, of course, in the United States have roots that go back to West Africa. And so this has particular resonance for us. It has resonance for us militarily, we have our largest embassy in all of Africa, in Niamey now. I'm going to speak at it in literally in 10, 12 days. I'm going to give a presentation at the largest U.S. embassy on the continent in Niamey. This is a chance really to do something landmark. The EU is very interested. Of course, Middle Eastern countries should be very interested. China is very interested in uh, Africa. And I think internationally, we're going to make these projects happen. Um, if you had to break it down, um, would, would the plan be to build one museum and then build the next museum after you've completed the first? Or is your idea that you want to build both simultaneously? No, I want to build both simultaneously. Um, the country is the only country in West Africa where the Tuaregs in the north or the nomads more broadly and the settled cultures of the south for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, such as Hausa, Germa, Songhai, have gotten together and said, hey, let's stop fighting uh, and, and let's collaborate and cooperate. And they regionally gave more power to the Agadez region to have a university, to, to educate and so on with the small amount of money that they have as a country. Uh, and that in, and I knew from the beginning, that means two museums, not, not a problem. Uh, a two museums, a regional museum and a capital museum. We have them in our own country, of course. Uh, we, we no longer bring all the dinosaurs to the Smithsonian. When it started, all we had was a national museum. And then the American Museum grew up as a counterpart. And now we have, you know, the Burpee Museum in Illinois and, of course, the Field Museum and, and many others out west that never existed uh, when I was a student. Museum of the Rockies. Whoever, I didn't know of such a place when there, there wasn't such a place when I was a student. Now it has more dinosaurs than the American Museum. So museums and cultures are becoming more local and two museums are necessary. And I, I would never think about building one and, and then thinking about the other. No, it's two museums. And the money really is split about 200 and 100 out of the 300 million necessary to do the project. It's pretty, it's pretty easy math in terms of what we need. And, and so how could it be done for this amount? Because a paleontologist has been very involved in the design of the museums, in the design of the amounts, the, the mounts, in the recovery of the fossils. It's not a team. I'm not saying I do everything by any chance. I, co I collaborate with everybody. But 
if you have one chef in the kitchen instead of a collaboration of people who've never met, you don't have to have committees, 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 committees. Uh, just to give you a comparative point of reference, in the city of Washington, D.C., our Smithsonian redid their dinosaur halls. The cost of that was roughly the cost of the Agadez Museum. They redid their dinosaur halls. In other words, they touched up the mounts and put new digital, and we're going to have better digital. We're going to walk into the Museum of the River, the Museum of the Desert, put on some earphones. You're going to be asked your language, and you're going to go up to an exhibit. There'll be a min minimal uh, French and English, and then you can listen to, to the exhibit. You want more information? You stand there, and you go to the next exhibit. We're in a digital era, and, and these museums are expected to be models for the future. And, uh, and it will impact virtually every single person in the country. And so anyway, that's, but that's a little perspective on cost. Of course, things are expensive in Europe and North America, but uh, we're talking about landmark museums being done for the cost of redoing a large North American dinosaur hall. I'm pretty proud of that, uh, that, uh, that budgetary uh, comparison. Great, thank you um, so much. Um, we have a couple other questions and since we're at the about 10 o'clock hour here um, this evening, uh, maybe we'll make this the last uh, couple uh, points. One is uh, you're already being invited uh, by one of our visitors to come to Hong Kong and give another speech. So hopefully maybe after your uh, expedition is complete and you get settled back into Chicago, maybe the quarantine will be lifted here in Hong Kong and we can have you back and you can tell us all about your expedition. I think it would be great. There seems to be really a lot of interest in what you're doing. And um, maybe the last question that I'll ask you for this evening comes from a 10 year old. And since you, uh, you know, uh, actually nurtured a young student from the age of 12, uh, this uh, student, this uh, question probably resonates, will resonate very well with you. So this student is in Hong Kong and is fascinated with your presentation and fascinated mm -hmm. with dinosaurs. And he or she wants to know what can they do to, to, to get in this field? How should they be thinking about it at an early age in a place and in a major city in Asia like Hong Kong? Well, first of all, Hong Kong, um, and the, the name of your student is... Uh... I don't have the student's name, but uh, I see. they're so, with their parents watching this program. Okay, to the, to the students and also to the parent, to the student and parents, um, we are in the era of discovery like no other. It can't go on forever, but I would say it's going to go on for at least a generation, the generation of your child and probably your child's child. We're going to be discovering, we're discovering dinosaurs and other ancient creatures at a rate we've never discovered before. Uh, the, the pace is unbelievable. That's because people know what fossils are, even in the middle of the Sahara Desert. It wasn't like that when I arrived. Everybody knows what a fossil is. Sometimes they want to make money on it, but they know what a fossil is. And so locals are discovering there's more paleontologists than ever. There's more museums, as I mentioned, than ever. And there's a scholar, for example, a dinosaur scholar in Hong Kong, as I'm speaking, David Hone, maybe tuning in. Uh, that's incredible when you think about it. Okay. Uh, and uh, so there, and how do you get involved? Well, you just, you, you find a museum, you find a local scholar, and there are societies of vertebrate paleontology that list all the scholars around the world, and there are many of them, and you get involved, you start doing projects, you volunteer, you, you, so that you can get up close and personal with fossils, and it goes on from there. So when you go to college, you, you study a scientific discipline, yes, but you, you have a chance to do projects, a senior thesis. It goes on from there. You go to graduate school, depending. The field has preparator positions and exhibit positions and inspector positions that don't require PhDs. And then there are other research positions that require a PhD. And so that's what you begin small. You begin in some ways, as I described, delving into natural history in your spare time. Uh, that's you, you want to show and develop your interest. And so to the young generation, the possibilities are there. It's an expanding field. Everybody wants that. And there's going to be a dinosaur exhibit that's coming to Hong Kong. It's going to have Spinosaurus in it, the skeleton I reconstructed. Uh, and I, I, I hope it's there when, I'm, when, when, when I come to visit, because I would love to come to visit Hong Kong. I've only uh, briefly been there once. 
uh, not nearly enough years ago, and I uh, would love to come back. Uh, the world is at our feet. We are pressed like we've never been pressed before to figure out solutions. Paleontology is part of that. So for the young generation, this is a, a great chance to go in the field. I would never say, you know, this is the best chance we've ever had because the field is expanding and it's alive and people want to learn about it. And, and you got dinosaur exhibits coming to Hong Kong because people are interested in it. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's my, uh, my comment to this uh, young uh, viewer. That's fantastic. And actually, you reminded me, our staff mentioned that there is a uh, dinosaur exhibition that is just opened or opening. And what we'll do is we'll put that exhibition link uh, on our uh, website. So you'll be able to find uh, where that exhibition is. But thanks for reminding me about that, Paul. One last question, um, because we are uh, in the era when climate change is severely affecting our world. Um, what are you learning about climate change um, from the work that you're doing with these fossils? That's a great question. And I think it is the deepest question to take from Gobro. Gobro experienced a climate change that ultimately eradicated its culture. And you sort of, you're, you're trying to answer a very difficult question in the eons of time recorded in the sand of Gobro, a difficult question. We can answer the height of the people when you answer what was their response to the crumbling of their world. And you, and, and, and you have to say that uh, as best as we can tell, uh, they, they didn't have a response. And we don't want that to be what happens to us today. The message from Gobro is that if climate change, severe climate change is in the future, you better wake up and take notice. We today are influencing the globe in ways that the people of Gobro could never even imagine. They were living peacefully for the longest time, 5,000 years in balance with nature. Their populations always maintained at a, at a pace that left them healthy, that left animals there, and then their world crumbled over forces they had no chance of controlling. We have a chance to control what's happening. And even just yesterday and the day before, I'm reading newspaper stories about how uh, I've, I've actually worked in the Arctic Circle once. I don't even know how there's any ice left. I, I went at the warmest time and there's 23 and a half hours of light. But I'm wearing a T-shirt inside the Arctic Circle. How is this, how is this possible that there's a single iceberg left? I, I, and when that ice melts, and it's going to melt, most of it's going to melt, we better have figured out some solutions to stopping or halting or, or me ameliorating our situation. And it's up to the, the kid that's answered, you know, asked that question. It's up to their generation to figure out ways to sequester the carbon uh, and, and move onwards to new technologies. We see it happening. It's happening faster and faster. But the message I take is, you know, it appears as though people want to do what they've been doing as a matter of course, that's not the world we live in anymore. We need to take action because we see where we're going. And uh, so the message about Gobro is sort of, you know, um, is, is, is that end ultimately what we're looking at? That humans, despite all the glory, despite all the smartness and intelligence are gonna fight to the end in useless wars and are not going to do enough to change our energy policies and and innovate fast enough to save ourselves it's a question and gobro sort of raises that question when you're looking at your you're digging up the last person which happens to be a young 10 year old our youngest person wearing a bracelet she was the la the last person that we have at gobro mm. is that our story it's a, you know, it's just a really interesting question for us. And I'm going to take away a thread of hope from what you said in that, you know, we are an intelligent being and there's so many tools and technologies today at our disposal that I think all we can do is hope and try to course correct. I, you know, I agree. I'll just say one last thing to end on a hopeful note as well. You, by doing the most modern museum in one of the poorest countries in the world that will benefit most from it, um, 
and conceiving of that project and then seeing people get behind it is very thrilling. I really do. I, I, I wouldn't be able to do what I do if I didn't have hope for a future. If my agreement with uh, the ancient peoples of Gobro and the dinosaurs that have no name were to end with a museum in a world that's going to end, it would make no sense. I'm very hopeful <laughs> that we will come to our senses. And uh, when you look for hopeful signs, you see poverty being reduced on a global level, even though you don't know it. Uh, you see many other positive signs. And I think that it's up to people to grab that torch of hope and carry it around and spread it. But I believe that we, we do have a hopeful future. That's part of human nature. Well, on that note, Professor Sereno, thank you so much for joining us tonight here in Hong Kong and uh, spending as much time as you did with us today. It's been really fantastic. Uh, and we look forward to kind of continuing on this journey um, with you do you have a Twitter account while you're in the desert? Or yes, you know, a... uh, we do have a Twitter and we have uh, Twitterers that are far better than me on the team, the younger generation. So we have Facebook, we have Twitter. We're going to post uh, something, uh, the background document that you saw on our website. We're going to link up. Uh, we will periodically be have great connections. And as I said, we're going to be making films that are going to appear, starting to appear next year on this expedition, hopefully a series uh, that will take you closer to than we have ever been to what it's like to be on one of these expeditions through the eyes, my, not just mine, but uh, especially the eyes of, of Grace, that young girl that came into my lab and others on the expedition, what it's like to go on an expedition to the Sahara and dig up uh, new animals. So yeah, it's going to be coming multimedia. Uh, watch my website for posts. Thank you so much, Paul. And if the audience is interested in learning any more about Professor Sereno's career story, you should check out the podcast that we've created here on the UN campus called The Course. It's available on various platforms such as Apple Music, Amazon Music, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and Simalaya. And uh, uh, Professor Sereno has uh, been gracious enough to share his time with us on that podcast. So find it on one of those platforms and, forms and listen and learn a little bit more about Professor Sereno's background, his career, and uh, he's taking us into very interesting places with the fantastic vision that he has. So um, I hope you can tune into that podcast. Um, next Thursday on August 25th at 8.30 p.m., we'll have a webinar on the Asian American experience called Debunking Model Minority Myths. And that uh, program will be featuring professors Matthew Briones, Yun Sun Choi from the University of Chicago, both of them are from the University of Chicago, and Ellen Wu from the in, uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, who's also a University of Chicago PhD alum. They'll be on that webinar next week and talking about uh, various topics related to anti-AAPI uh, violence and hate in the COVID era, affirmative action in, in admissions policies, and the persistent specter of the model minority myth in the United States. So tune in for that um, and make sure that you join us uh, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. We're, you know, everywhere. So you can't miss us if you're, you're on social media uh, to learn more about what the UN campus is up to uh, this, the rest of this summer and through the rest of this year. Uh, for all of you out there, have a wonderful evening. Thanks for hanging in there with us and uh, have a wonderful evening or day wherever you may be.